Welcome everyone once again. Let's talk about social inclusion. And let's talk today about how white people's wealth and sympathy towards black people affect their support for policies that, that help black Americans financially. So the authors of the study are here today, Tara Williams and Andrew Blosser, and they will show us that richer white people who feel bad about black struggles are more likely to support these policies and way more to discuss now. Tara, Andrew, welcome to our episode. Thanks Thank for you. So Andy, prior, uh, prior research shows, it was in the article, that racial sympathy can lead to support for these policies among whites, but it doesn't consider economic factors. So is that why you started this research? Yeah, very much. So we often think about economic inequality in the United States and in a lot of contexts, right, is being vertical, right? The rich have more, everyone else, especially lower income people have less, right? But we were invited to do a special issue of social inclusion that encouraged us to think about horizontal inequality or the inequalities that exist across groups. And so we know in the United States that not only do we have uh, significant economic gaps between the rich and poor, but also between uh, white Americans and people of color and specifically black Americans who have uh, been long historically marginalized and discriminated against group. So we began to think about, well, if we're going to remedy that problem, if we think it's bad that there's racial inequality and there's racial economic inequality, how might we address that? And so in the United States, the form of horizontal redistribution, right, to address horizontal uh, inequality to, with horizontal redistribution, in the United States, the most common approach to that is race-targeted policy, so policies that would direct economic resources to Black Americans specifically. But if you're going to make that work, right, uh, then people who are advocating for those policies need broad public support, and they need broad support from white Americans who are the largest racial group, right? And so there's some emerging research, right, from Jennifer Chudy doing some really pathbreaking work on this concept of racial sympathy, which suggests that if you want uh, white Americans to support policies that benefit Black Americans, it really helps if they are concerned about the struggles and the challenges that Black Americans face. And uh, Jennifer Trudy finds that actually uh, across white Americans, there's actually a relatively high level of racial sympathy, which suggests that that's possible. And Trudy also finds that white Americans with higher levels of racial sympathy are more likely to support these race targeted policies that would constitute horizontal redistribution across racial groups. But um, what we uh, were considering is maybe white people are not monolithic, right? Uh, white folks' economic circumstances vary pretty considerably. We have wealthy white Americans. We have middle income white Americans. We have working class and lower income white Americans. And so just thinking about white Americans doesn't give us enough information to know if racial sympathy will translate into support for black Americans when white Americans get uh, no direct benefit from those policies. They'd be supporting them only because they're directly concerned about black Americans and think that policies are needed to address those specific concerns. So for wealthier white Americans, that might be a green light. If they're racially sympathetic, they'll support those policies. But for white Americans who have more economic insecurity, particularly those who have lower incomes, right, even if they're racially sympathetic, they may be concerned that supporting a policy that benefits black Americans but doesn't benefit white Americans like themselves, maybe that threatens their uh, their status, maybe they're concerned that black Americans uh, might get ahead of them, and even if they're sympathetic toward black Americans, they may still be worried about falling behind themselves. And so that was a possibility that scholarship had not considered. And so our study, uh, we can see of our study is a way of saying, well, maybe relative economic position matters among white people, and maybe that's something with real political consequences. So that's what we sought out to investigate in this study. And you jumped right into it. You uh, observed this non-monolithic group of white people and their uh, attitudes and economic position. Tara, what are the main findings of this study? So what would you highlight? So um, I think there's a couple of things that I want to sort of emphasize. Um, we, when we looked at this, um, we used some nationally representative survey data um, from 2013, um, which maybe we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but uh, the the goal was to find something that could allow us to analyze racial sympathy and also to think about economic position. And so, economic position, we use a measure of income, um, as I think 
uh, Andrew just referred to um, in our study and basically try and see whether or not racial sympathy is predictive of people's support for these race targeted policies. In particular, we're focused on government support for black businesses, government support for black schools, government support for black scholarships and affirmative action um, as our sort of primary outcomes. Um, that's not an exhaustive list clearly of race targeted policies, but I think it gives us um, a window into uh, when people turn racial sympathy into support for some of these um, horizontally redistributive policies. Um, and so we find two things that I think are really worth noting. The first, um, given sort of our, our our question about whether or not like this monolith um, uh, exists, one thing we, we wondered at, at just out of the gate was whether or not people had similar levels of racial sympathy, regardless of where they were on the economic scale. So is it the case that there's just more racial sympathy, maybe concentrated among people who have less concern about material resources? And we don't find that. We find that there's very similar average levels of racial sympathy among lower income groups, middle income groups, higher income groups, um, however we sort of stratify it, um, that that is something that's relatively consistent um, that, and, and, and that it's higher than the midpoint of our scale so that there's like a, a decent reservoir of this racial sympathy that is available. But um, also consistent with the expectations laid out, um, it is not the case that people who have those high levels even of racial sympathy among lower income groups turn that into support for racially redistributive policy attitudes the way that people who have a lot of racial sympathy in higher income brackets are able to. Um, and so we think this is important because it suggests, first of all, that there's just not a simple relationship. It, it's easy to think about how racial sympathy might translate into support for race targeted policies, but it really seems like there's this really important condition that people need to feel a certain amount of financial security in order to be able to move from racially sympathetic attitudes to support for some of these policies. Well, uh, Andy, I assume that is that uh, policymakers will be probably the first uh, group to be interested in knowing these findings. But can you tell us more about well, who can learn from this data and what can they learn? Sure. So I think uh, there may be two sets of people who might find this interesting. Um, one, policymakers. Uh, and second, we might think about uh, interest groups, activists, right, who are trying to promote particular policies, right? So if I'm, you're thinking about this from a policymaking perspective, right, uh, there's certainly going to be ongoing conversations about uh, things that constitute horizontal redistribution and race targeted policies, right? We already see headlines about, you know, funding for black schools, colleges, black businesses, um, there's even been conversations in recent presidential election cycles about reparations, right? Um, and so clearly, right, there are going to be, for those who are advocating for those policies, there are some possibilities and some challenges, right? So the possibilities, as Tara was alluding to, is that among white Americans, who again, largest uh, racial group in America, right, a significant number of uh, voters there, right? Uh, they, there's racial sympathy among white Americans broadly across the income range. And that suggests that policymakers and activists, right, could try to tap into that racial sympathy and say, here's the historic reason for concerns. Here's why we need a policy that will address reparations. And we actually have seen on small scale, some communities uh, enacting policies like this, right? Um, particularly, there's a community um, near, I think it's Evanston, Illinois, uh, right, uh, that's been uh, considering some of these things. And they're a more affluent white community, where there's apparently a lot of racial sympathy, right? So in small scale context, that can matter. Uh, but there's also some real challenges here, which I think is the bigger lesson coming from, uh, from our research is that, okay, racial sympathy exists, but it's not enough just to be sympathetic. You have to back that sympathy with actual policy support. And there we're seeing as, uh, as incomes you know, decline among white Americans, the white Americans with the lowest incomes uh, are the least likely to support uh, race targeted policies. And so that suggests a wedge issue. Some white Americans who are more affluent might support those policies, uh, at least to some degree, but there's a lot of other Americans, lower middle class, working class, lower income Americans who might be very turned off by that. And not necessarily, not necessarily because they're not sympathetic to the challenges black folks face, not because they're necessarily opposed to economic redistribution uh, broadly, but because they're concerned about perhaps falling behind or about some other group getting something uh, that's putting them ahead, right? 
And so even if you're sympathetic toward a group, you're not necessarily going to support benefits to that group if you yourself are not getting those benefits and are worried about falling behind, right? And so if there are candidates or interest groups who are uh, advocating for those policies, you can imagine the opposition and the wedge issue that that would create for people who are opposed to race targeted policies or economic redistribution broadly, right? They could really tap into that. Now, alternatively, right, that suggests maybe there's some different strategies for those who uh, believe that we need uh, more economic redistribution and economic redistribution that would, uh, in, to some degree, target benefits to those who have been historically marginalized or who, for whatever reason, have the greatest need. Um, but that might be an alternative strategy, right, thinking about both uh, horizontal and vertical redistribution as being linked. Right. Uh, that uh, that might provide a better strategy for those who want to advocate for uh, for solutions to this kind of problem. And we can talk more about what that could look like. But I think that's one of the key lessons. That's perfect. Um, Tara, you said uh, so research is based on data from uh, 2013. And we said we'll go back to that. So let's. Um, should uh, future research focus on more recent data and considering probably changes uh, in more recent presidencies? So what's ahead of us in terms of research? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the uh, sort of key things that we would recommend is sort of updating this and updating this in a 2024 or maybe even 2025 world. Um, so in particular, um, the reason we focus on the 2013 data is because this, this measure exists in it, right? Um, and um, the there is a growing uh, focus on um, racial sympathy. In fact, Jennifer Judy's book, I think, comes out tomorrow, which will hopefully um, push for some additional work um, that is looking uh, in this area. Um, but I think um, one of the things that, one of the reasons why it's so important to update it, there's a couple of things that happen simultaneously. One, um, the sort of national discourse and landscape in the United States has changed dramatically since 2013. The way that we're talking about race now is distinct. Um, additionally, the sort of legislative approach or even um, sort of court-based approach um, to uh, some of these questions, right, is different now. Affirmative action was overturned um, by the, the Supreme Court, right? There's currently like a scramble happening to figure out what is possible um, in terms of uh, some of this race-targeted policy that could have been taken for granted in a way, um, at least more so in 2013. Um, we also have at the state level, and there's certainly pushes nationally in the US here, um, to uh, try and eliminate um, various kinds of um, sort of protections, focuses on um, various kinds of policy that would specifically benefit um, people coming from diverse backgrounds. Um, and so this is, you know, currently a policy debate that is being waged that is very public and that might have changed attitudes, right? And so it would be really interesting to know if the same connections exist between um, racial sympathy and these uh, race targeted policies, and also to know a little bit more about how economic position has been changing in all of this, right? Because so much populist rhetoric um, has brought these things together in a very public way. And so I think the the very first thing we would sort of recommend for um, future research would be to update this and to continue studying it um, in the sort of changing uh, US context. Um, I think one other thing I might note um, that we would also be sort of really encouraging um, is to sort of think about other ways um, to understand economic position as well. Um, so we focus on income. In some ways, it's straightforward. Um, in other ways, it misses things like wealth or other sorts of objective factors we can look at. And um, I think given one of maybe your recent podcasts, um, also misses things like perceptions, like how people feel about their economic security, right? Um, and so we would also encourage people to be thinking um, at, for ourselves, for our future research and for others, um, to be thinking about how people feel in terms of that economic security um, and whether or not that in and of itself, even putting income aside or anything that is sort of a more objective measure could also really um, weaken this relationship between racial sympathy and race targeted policy support. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yes, it was an episode on Nim Langer from the same issue actually, um, to those who are listening. Uh, Andy. You did this a bit before, and you two spoke a bit about some hypotheses, some ex expectations that were met, others weren't. So my question is now, what were your thoughts after looking at uh, the findings and after reflecting deeply on these findings? Yeah, so one of the things that I'm really curious about is we know that 
race targeted policies, that approach to horizontal redistribution can be a tough sell, right? Even where there are white folks who are racially sympathetic, if they're not feeling secure in their own economic well-being, they're not going to support those policies, right? But they're still sympathetic, right, to uh, the concerns of some of their fellow Americans, and they may not be opposed to uh, all forms of economic redistribution. In fact, uh, Tara and I have another paper in Politics, Groups, and Identities that find that lower-income white Americans, even when they have high levels of racial resentment, right, they have negative attitudes about Black people, will still support some kinds of social welfare policies, provided that they themselves directly benefit. And so there's, I think, a suggestion there, right, about another uh, forum, another approach to public policy that's, that's worthy of investigation, right, which is, well, what if you could combine uh, econo uh, vertical economic redistribution and horizontal redistribution? Right. And so there is an approach. Uh, some uh, public policy scholars call it uh, targeting within universalism. Right. Where the universalism says everybody gets something. Right. Everyone's going to get some uh, level of uh, policy benefits. But you're going to design those policies such that those who have the greatest need for whatever reason are going to uh, to benefit most from those policies. Right. Um, and so we can think about a policy that's um, that's getting some traction now at small scale, universal basic income. Right. Everybody. So the trial programs in the United States and in other places around the world have de generally done about five hundred to a thousand dollars per month. Right. Direct cash payments to people. Right. And in a truly universal basic income program, everybody would get that five hundred or one thousand dollars a month. Right. Everyone would benefit and see some reason maybe to support the policy. Right. Uh, now, for those who are very wealthy, regardless of race, right, if you're making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, maybe five hundred or a thousand dollars a month doesn't greatly change your circumstances. You might still be glad to have it. Right. But it's not really going to be a huge thing for you. But imagine now people who are uh, kind of at the lower end of the middle class, the working class, lower income folks, 500 or a thousand dollars a month for them proportionally is going to make a big difference. Right. And so we could imagine, right, that if uh, people who are more financially insecure, um, right, whether they have high levels of racial resentment or whether they have high levels of racial sympathy, right, they would like to do something to help uh, their fellow citizens, right, who have a different racial group, but they're concerned about their own economic well-being. Would a program like Universal Basic Income help those racially sympathetic folks say, yeah, uh, okay, this would benefit my fellow Americans, it would benefit me too, and now I see reason to support this policy. You still get some horizontal redistribution that way, but nested within an approach that focuses on vertical uh, economic redistribution as well. And given that white Americans have different economic circumstances, there may be some pragmatism in that approach for those who are looking to address the economic redistribution issue. And likewise, even for racially resentful, uh, Americans, right? Those who have negative, white Americans who have negative attitudes toward black Americans, they might also support that same policy, right? Because even if they resent black Americans, rather than being sympathetic to them, they might still see some benefit to themselves. And so the, the idea here might be to look for converging interests and to build policy around that. Now, that's one possibility suggested by this study, another paper we did, and some research of other scholars. But that needs to be tested, right? It needs to be tested in academic settings, and at some point, right, uh, practitioners who are interested in this would need to test it out in the real world, right? But uh, but that, I think, is where there are some interesting possibilities to explore. Well, perfect. Well, reflections that can open like more thematic issues in the future. <laughs> for, for those of it's, uh, it's great. Tara, um, this episode has had a lot of great punchlines, great mottos, uh, great messages, but a challenge to all our speakers that I always uh, give in no more than two sentences, if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk, what would it be? So I think the most basic thing is that material conditions matter. Um, in particular, if you want people to be uh, supportive, so, and when I say you, we're probably thinking about practitioners and policy folks here, right? Um, if you want people to support something like race targeted policies, we need to think about people's own economic conditions first, right? And sort of that like potential coupling between vertical and horizontal redistribution may be the key to it, um, but uh, definitely to not ignore how economic position might shape people's willingness to support um, policies that can benefit historically marginalized groups. Straight to the point. Tara, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us.
So for those who are watching us on YouTube, you can find all the resources, all the links, all the materials of this conversation that Tara and Andrew and I just had. Um, you help the links to the research, so the study that they conducted and to the thematic issue. You can listen to this episode wherever you get your podcast, the link to the Twitter, to the newsletter, etc.